So the fall of 1909, 3.2 million bricks are put down here where the brickyard, right? And this is that yard of bricks that, uh, that you're chasing when you're a race car driver here. You get a chance to be the first car to cross this three times to win the Indianapolis 500. But I want to talk about something that has nothing to do with you except a good friendship. I can't help every time I'm here but think about Dan Weldon how much he loved this place, but in particular, when he won in 2011, how he came out here, laid down on his back, and just took it all in. That guy loved the 500 just about as much as anybody that's ever lived. Yeah, no, he really did. And you, you asked me earlier about my, my passion for the race, and some of it was being his teammate, because he bounced in here in 2003 to do his first 500. And he loved it. He loved, and, and I got this. He, it was infectious. His enthusiasm was infectious, and I, I think that helped me to, to, to understand and to fall in love with this place. And the same with Tony. We were all caught up in Dan's enthusiasm for it. Um, 2011 was an, an interesting race because we were another race. I was felt fortunate to be in the hunt to win it, and um, ultimately Dan and his team they made the right moves, and and he came through and he won it. Dan Weldon is going. And it was one of those points, I remember I was sitting down there and I was, I was pretty down, I hadn't won. Yep. And then I thought, no, snap out of it, your mate's just pulled off something incredible and you should go and congratulate him. And I stopped him down there and I gave him a big hug and told him how proud I was of him. And um, with everything that happened, I'm, I'm glad I was able to, to do that. But as you see that picture of him lying here, it's just, it's, it's iconic and um, yep. yeah, it, it was, what a story though, what a job he did that, that month to, to pull off that win. He, he had a feeling for this track and a, and a technique and, a, and an ability around here that very few have and you always knew, regardless of the car he was in, you were going to have to contend with Dan at, at some point. So 2010, you get a chance to celebrate your second victory and what's interesting to me, looking back on it, you get to be on the right and the left hand side of Dan's, Dan's second win. Um, so you guys are in a little bit of a battle, You're, so you become a second time winner before he, before, before he does. What did 2010 win in that race mean after 2007 being a range shortened race? Um, you know, I'd, I'd gone away and I'd, I'd attempted to, to do something in NASCAR that wasn't, uh, wasn't so successful. So I really felt I had something to prove coming back and I realized in that off time how much I loved IndyCar racing, how much I loved the Indy 500 and that's what I felt. I, I mean, that's what I wanted to do. That was what my, what my passion was. So to come back in that period, 9, 10, 11, 12, we were in, had, had a, a car and we were, I, we were in contention as a group to win any one of those races. And that, that's all you can ask for. And then you've got to put the pieces together and, and we did it two out of those four years. But 2010, the car was so fast. It was in, in, a, in a spec series, it was mad. At one point, I think we were half the, the track ahead of the field, and it was just such a quick car. Yep. Tricky thing to drive. I actually bounced it off the wall on turn one. I got a little bit loose there, but it was, it was quick. And the, 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 um, the yellow came out, and we pitted, everybody pitted, and we had to make some crazy number yep. of fuel mileage. And I didn't like that. I liked making fuel. It was you know, part of my Scottish upbringing. I always imagine I'm paying for it myself. So. This is one of those deals where you'd pay $2 million for a gallon or two. Mike Conway crashed and we, uh, and it ended under yellow. We, we had just enough fuel. I mean, I think I had half, a, half because of the yellow, right. um, the last lap I had half, half a gallon of fuel left in the thing. But the oil cooler had split on the last, uh, on, on the pick Mike Conway the, debris. debris. Yeah, so not only was there not a lot of fuel in it, but there was a lot of oil <laughs> all over the floor. So um, that was the most dominant car, the 2010 race. And um, yeah, that that um, that was one of those, my engineer Chris Simmons just, him and I worked just on the smallest details for the whole, uh, the whole practice. And we, we had a car that, you know, was quick and we were able to execute. So you talk about your year off in 08, um, but you've been able to do something that not a lot of race car drivers do. Elio Castroneves won four Indy 500s, but never won a championship. So you win four championships and, and three Indy 500s, all sort of in that six year period where you're able to dominate across the board. And I, you did come back in 09, you win a championship in 09, and come back in 10, win the 500 and a championship. I mean, you are on a, on a big time, a big time role at that point. But does it sink in that you've not, you're no longer an Indy 500 winner, you're a two time Indy 500 winner, which puts you in another stratosphere. 
Yeah, it did because um, one of the things that I think I'm most fortunate with is that the, the legends of the sport became my friends. You know, those heroes of ours from the 60s and the 70s, they became my friends. Right. And they would say, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, welcome to the club, yeah. but now you're, you're moving up. Yep. And they, they, they kind of helped me understand what it meant. Uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, Alan Sir Jr. I mean, just people that you had have been watching as you're beginning your racing career. So Al Jr. said something when he won. And he stood up there and he said, you don't know what indie means. Well, you just don't know what indie means. <laughs> I don't remember at the time watching that going, Al. I didn't know Al at the time. I'm like, Al, what are you talking about? What was he, what, what does that even mean? And round about that period, I, it clicked. I'm like, yeah, Al, I know exactly what you mean. And I, I told him that, I said, when you said it, you know, and it just, it, 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 that sums up everything that everybody puts into this race, everything everybody lays on the line to compete here, um, on the track, drivers, mechanics, engineers, everybody. And um, yeah, I, to, to win it the second time was, uh, was beyond my wildest expectations. So we'll talk about the third time, and I want to go down to turn one because that's a special point. But as we sort of wrap up this segment, we head down there. This Yard of Bricks also in 2012 for that third time is a pretty cool moment for you because it's under yellow but you get to cross the yard of bricks in maybe one of the most unique finishes in the history of the Speedway with two of your buddies right behind you. Yeah, Scott and, and Tony, um, I was going to say riding, um, riding shotgun, but they were trying to beat me. <laughs> they were, they were, let's, not, let's not mistake anything here. Um, that was, to me, that was special because we were, the, the 2012 Indy 500 was really a celebration of Dan. Yep. And, we were, the three of us were, were, were great friends of, of Dan's um, and we helped his brothers actually um, at his funeral and so that was, um, that was special. That was, and it, it didn't matter which one of us won it, but to, to cross the line with those two guys was special. Making sure they were behind me, that was even more special. <laughs> well that race, that's one of the things I think people forget about that race because it's more known for an epic battle after a last caution, especially going down to turn one. So let's go down there and talk about turn one. So we're standing here at the entry to turn one, most epic corner in motorsport. It's a challenging corner when you're by yourself qualifying. You can't see around it. It's just like, it's, it's a tunnel. But the white flags drop for the Indianapolis 500. There's an epic battle going on, you and Dixon and Sato. You're less than two and a half miles away from win number three, but you got a guy whose phrase is, no attack, no chance. You know he's gonna do something. What's going through your mind as you're 230 miles an hour getting ready to turn left with Takuma Sato behind you? Is out. Dario Franchitti takes the defensive line into one. Sato taking a peek. Oh, inside, they are inside, 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 inside. Keep going, keep going. In 12, I'd been spun at the first pit stop um, and got back going again the guys did a great job um, I was lucky I had a team of, of mechanics on the in the pit stops a group of people who the more pressure that was on them the better they performed and that's that's rare and that is a, a great group to have but so they fixed it and Barry Wanda my strategist said hey okay don't worry a lot of the race to go we'll be okay and I said something like what what, what movie are you watching <laughs> you know anyway I got on with it and by 30 laps later I was back in the lead of the race I knew we had a good car but I also knew Scott had a good car. And him and I, for that sort of next 100 laps, wherever we're just playing the, just drafting each other, kind of trying to stay up front, keep track position. Tony got involved for a minute, and I was quite happy with that, because I always knew with Tony we could have the closest race and there'd be no funny business. Kanana's gonna oh. get it. Kanana's gonna get it, he's in the lead. Um, Sattel got involved and I was a bit more worried about that. Anyway, the two laps to go, Sato passes Scott here. He'd been making these passes all day, having watched the race a few years ago. He'd get to about a quarter of the way alongside and cause the car on the outside to have to lift. Scott had to lift, and that was really the end of Scott's right. championship uh, challenge that day of the 500. And he had, Scott had driven a perfect race. Up until that point, Scott had driven an absolutely perfect race that day. Anyway, we come off the of turn four coming to the white flag and I look at my mirrors and I think right good we're okay he's far enough back and at this point just to give you an idea the mindset there's no tension I, I learned over the years of doing this race just to to relax and let it whatever happen happen I'm like, okay fine and then I look again just as we get towards the yard of bricks and I think oh he's 
he's going to be going, he's coming here. And I turned in wide open in the green, I'm not lifting. I'm either going to crash or I'm going to come out of this corner first, but I'm not lifting. And he's on the inside and my spotter, Scott Harner, is up there and Scott said, okay, inside. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so inside, and his voice, Scott's got a pretty deep voice, and his voice was getting more and more higher pitched. Inside, it's an... Inside, 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 keep going, keep going. By this point, I've started to get away from him, because as, as Scott's getting more higher pitched, I realise, you know, I want to get away from him. And I'm finding grip and I'm still wide open. So I'm stepping up a bit more, still got grip, still got grip. I don't really know that he's spinning on the inside at this point. Then I hear this, I feel this bump because of the, the, the pods at the back of the wheels, they connect. Right. And the car gets a bit sideways. I get about 180 degrees of opposite and got it straight. And then the problem is Dixon's coming. <laughs> so I'm pulling down gears, trying to shift them. Oh, come on, and, and Harner's going, come on, come on. I'm going, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I've got my foot flat, and I get the engine back into the power band and get to sprint ahead just as the yellow comes out. And then the rest of the lap was, um, I found my legs were shaking. I remember crossing the finish line, even under yellow. And I've got Tony and Scott there, and my legs were shaking, and, and in victory lane, and it was, um, yeah, I just, I wasn't going to, I might have crashed, um, but I wasn't. I wasn't going to lift, and I gave, I gave Sato the room. He's the one that made the mistake. Um, and then afterwards, in the, in the bus lot, I was sitting having a beer with my my Scottish buddies who'd been for, to every one of my, my wins. And Sato comes up, and I thought he was going to say, "We're a well done, good race, whatever." And he said, "Oh, you should have given me more room." I said, "I'm sorry." <laughs> and then we had a bit of a discussion. I taught him some new, some new words, and, and then asked, invited him to leave because he was ruining my buzz. <laughs> It was Al Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, like. Yeah. I mean, two guys that are like, I'm winning this race, and and you laid it all out there. Second's okay here, but it kind of sucks. <laughs> and so I, I, yeah, that was the, that was what it was all about. And at, before the race, I was talking to Uncle Bobby, um, and and he, you know, these guys, he hadn't driven a racing car in a long time, and he said to me, he said, hey, just be careful. You never know where they're going to come from today. You need eyes in the back of your head. And after the race, I said, how did you know he went? And he just kind of went. <laughs> uh, so let's, we'll, we'll, go, we'll fast forward another year. Turn one isn't as kind to you. But there's a conspiracy theory out here that the turn one crash at the end of the 2013 race was all planned so that Tony Kanaan could win the Indy 500. So anyway, it was yellow. And we come down here and I turn in. And as soon as I start to put some wheel and you can feel the, the, the wheel loading up normally, the wheel didn't load up, it just slid. And it was, I, I knew from about the apex that I was gonna probably crash. And then as I got closer to the wall, I realized it was gonna probably hurt. Um, and it actually did, it was a big old shunt. Um, you know, all the time I drove at the speedway, I only ever really hit the wall three times. That, that one, the first day I tested here, and uh, leading the 2010 race. It was all exactly the same spot. <laughs> but yeah, there was no conspiracy. I was delighted that Tony won it, but um, as I say, I didn't know where he was. Never mind, uh, never mind me. So I don't know if you knew it at that moment, but at some point in time, it has to hit you that it's Dario Franchitti, Dan Weldon, Dario Franchitti, Tony Kanaan, the three amigos right together. What's the Today, even looking back on that, how special is that, knowing the bond that the three of you had together? Yeah, if you look, when I, when I look at the Borg Warner Trophy, um, I had it in the house a couple of years ago. Steve Shunkin, the guys brought it over to, to the UK. Um, and to look at that sort of period of time and be on there beside my friends, is, it, it means the world to me. Um, especially now with, with you know, time moving on. Um, my daughter, Sophia, she came running through the hall when it was in there and she's got sprinted past and she sort of skidded to a halt and she's run back to the trophy and she's looked down and she went, look daddy, look. And I thought, oh, she's gonna say, look, there's daddy. She went, look, Uncle Scott. <laughs> what do you mean, Uncle Scott? Well, there's daddy and daddy and daddy, but no, no, Uncle Scott. Thanks for spending the time with us. Race fans, one of the most historic, one of the most successful drivers in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Long after we're all gone, they will remember Dario Franchitti for those three wins. But his four championships, he's led 339 laps at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway 
I didn't, only, I didn't know that. <laughs> there's only two of your contemporaries that have done any more, and it's because they've done it longer. Scott Dixon and Tony Kanaan. There was nobody better behind a wheel at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway than Dario Franchitti. Thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for joining us on Behind the Bricks. We'll see you next time, probably in May, when we have cars running to go racing for the 106th running of the Indy 500.